Hello, glad you could join me. In this video, I would like us to take a closer look at the topic I touched on in my critique of Rocking Philosophy's argument against evolution. That video was titled Rocking Sophistry. If you recall, Rocking Mr. E used an argument made by Professor Walter Wieth in support of his position. In this video, we shall be taking a closer look at the argument made by the professor. But before we move on, I would like to address an issue that was raised in the comments section of my response video. Yes, I do actually read the comments. A few people took issue with the fact that I stated that evolution and biogenesis, or abiogenesis if you want to be technically correct, should be treated as distinct areas of interest. A few in the comments thought that this was a somewhat arbitrary distinction. They have a valid point. It may be that when sufficient evidence has accumulated, we will find that the entire process is Darwinian in nature. It would seem likely that chemical replication would precede any processes that we might recognize as biological. The reason I made the distinction is that evolution presupposes replication and is well evidenced. Biogenesis, on the other hand, is less well understood. We can talk with some certainty about evolution, but abiogenesis is somewhat speculative and will remain so for reasons which I hope to detail later. But the commenters identified a valid issue. Where do we draw the line between the two, and is it valid to do so? I would suggest that, at the moment, it is a valid distinction to make. The commenters believe that it is somewhat dubious. Both are well-considered positions. I shall leave it up to you to decide whether there is sufficient difference between the two areas of study to justify making a distinction or not. So having got that out of the way, let's move on to the main topic. Rocking Mr. E used a section from a video presented by Dr. Walter Wieth in support of his criticism of evolutionary science. The section he used was taken from a video produced by Amazing Discoveries. The video itself can be found on a website called amazingdiscoveries.org, and its title is The Genes of Genesis versus the DNA of Evolution. Now, this video is nearly an hour and a half long, so we won't be going through the entire thing. We shall focus on the particular section that was used by Rocking Mr. E in his argument, because although Dr. Veith does not present an original argument, it is one that keeps cropping up in creationist publications and videos in one form or another on a regular basis. And it also has a tendency to morph over time because its proponents believe it to be an effective argument. So let's listen to Dr. Veith as he makes his point. Don't worry, it's only three minutes and I'm pretty sure most viewers will identify correctly the general argument being used. It's hardly new. After we've listened to Dr. Veith impress his audience, we should examine the argument he uses in some detail. So take it away, Professor. There's another amazing story of life. Even if you get all the building blocks to form, how would you get it to form a string containing all the information that you need for life? How would you get it to do that? It has never ever been demonstrated in a laboratory it needs a very complex enzyme system that will form these high energy bonds that are locked into this molecule. And the probability of these molecules forming is so remote so that we could say they are non-existent. So let's have a look at what the probability would be, for example, of a bomb exploding under a pile of wood going and then falling down from the sky and forming this perfect functional little house. What would the probability be? Well, the probability is very, very remote. Let's give it a very good probability, or a or very poor one. In fact, it's even much worse than this. Let's say the probability is 1 in 10 to the power of 80. Hmm. Now, what is that? That sounds like a very small figure. 10 to the power of 80 is what physics claims is the number of particles in the entire universe. Particles. That means not only atoms, but subparticles. Electrons, hadrons, quarks, neutrons, protons in the entire universe. How many atoms in a pinhead? Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions, right? So imagine how many atoms in the entire universe. 
It sounds mind-boggling, but it's only 10 to the power of 18. It's not a very big number when you look at it, but that is really a mind-boggling number. 10 with 80 zeros behind it. So that would be the probability. What would be the probability of a simple gene coming into existence by chance? Well, there are three nucleotides needed to code for one amino acid in a protein. And let's take a simple protein that has 100 amino acids. Your hemoglobin, for, for example, has 600 amino acids. So let's take a simple protein, 100 amino acids. You need 300 nucleotides in the right sequence. Hmm. What's the probability of that happening by chance? Well, the probability is 10 to the power of 127. That is, unfortunately, boom! New York City has been established by a nuclear explosion. Do you believe that? Now, before we move on, I know that this has annoyed a few of the mathematical types out there. We need to address the slide the good professor uses in his presentation because it's simply incorrect. This is not a probability. A probability is expressed by a value between 0 and 1. If one flips a coin, there are two potential outcomes. Either it will land on heads or it will land on tails. So we have one trial and two potential outcomes. This gives us 1 over 2, or 0.5. So whatever we're looking at here, it does not appear to be a probability. Worse, it is not even the number of particles in the universe. That would be 3.28 10 to the 80. But let's not be too pedantic about such things. The number of zeros seems to be about right. Let's allow the good professor a minor error. It should be fairly obvious that the professor's argument is a variation on the Boeing 747 and the junkyard argument. This was popularized by Fred Hoyle who argued that the probability of abiogenesis is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747. Vith used the analogy of a bomb assembling a house, or even more impressive, a nuclear bomb producing a city. I have no idea why Fred Hoyle decided this was the case, as brilliant as he was. When he made a misstep in reasoning, it was never trivial. He coined the term Big Bang when arguing against the expanding universe model, and he used the junkyard tornado analogy when deriding contemporary theories of abiogenesis. The irony is, he played a significant role in both. His perhaps unwitting contribution to our understanding of abiogenesis I will detail later. But you can understand why Hoyle's analogy was picked up and used later by creationists, because on the surface it seems like a pretty convincing argument. I will not be trying to impress you with large numbers here, and we have done with the maths. What we need to consider is only what is more likely or less likely, what is probable or not probable, and perhaps what is possible or impossible. This will be sufficient for our purpose. The probability of life on Earth is 1. We exist. There is no doubt about that. It seems to have happened at least once. But the question is, how long would you have to sit beside the primordial soup before a protein emerged? This would be a long time. Perhaps an infinitely long time. And there lay the issue. How long would you have to wait until multiple celled organisms assemble themselves by mere chance? even given the right chemical environment. That also would be an extremely unlikely event. So there must be something we're missing, some mechanism or process that we're not considering. Most scientists would agree that life did not first come about merely by chance. Proteins and DNA did not assemble themselves by random processes. There are several competing theories in relation to how life might have arisen. But as far as I know, while randomness plays varying roles in these theories, none, it would seem, puts chance in the driver's seat when considering complex structures. If you were playing craps in a casino, perhaps in Las Vegas, and the dice kept landing on six, you might suspect that the dice was loaded. The probability of the dice landing on the same number, although not impossible, becomes ever more unlikely, and you start to begin to look for an explanation. The more technical term for this is bias. The coin that always falls on the same face 
or the die that lands on the same number are biased, and in casinos the bias will unlikely be in your favour. The universe is governed by fundamental physical forces. Mass and gravity means that matter is attracted to itself. Gravity and mass have introduced a bias. Matter tends to clump, and the universe is filled with stars, primarily consisting of hydrogen. These huge structures did not assemble themselves by chance. Most scientists attribute the structure we see in the night sky as a product of natural forces. Purely random events at the macro-level scale are not that common. Nuclear decay is perhaps one example, but most events, even if seemingly random, are not independent of the laws of physics. They take place within a biased system. That is the nature of our reality. Before we leave our cosmological detour, we shall consider Sir Fred Hoyle's contribution to our understanding of nuclear synthesis. This might sound a bit of an odd detour, but it is relevant, and I suspect that the chemists out there have already guessed where I'm heading. Nuclear synthesis is the process by which elements that make up the periodic table came about. The problem was that cosmologists had determined that the Big Bang could only have produced hydrogen and some helium with traces of lithium. They knew that the heavier elements would have had to have been made by the process of nuclear synthesis inside stars, because that was the only place which had the environment in which they could have been produced. But physicists had a problem, and it wasn't a trivial one. The exact nature of this issue is beyond the scope of this video, but it was given the nickname the Five Nucleon Crevasse. In simple terms, they couldn't figure out the process by which helium became carbon, and then the heavier elements. Fred Hoyle was pivotal in describing the mechanism that must have been involved and therein lay the irony, because carbon itself is central to our story. We move now from cosmology to physics and chemistry, because now we have carbon, we're a little closer to life itself. In fact, the difference between organic and inorganic matter is the presence or absence of carbon. Now, I'm not a chemist, so I'm not qualified to wax lyrical on the properties of carbon, but I've heard it described as a rather promiscuous atom. It seems to be attracted to all sorts of other atoms. And of course, as any science fiction fan will tell you, with some authority, all life as we know it is carbon-based. If we were playing cosmic detective and investigating our biogenesis, our prime suspect would be the carbon atom. Its fingerprints are all over the crime scene. It is overly friendly and can bond not only with itself, but also four other atoms, which makes for complex and interesting molecules. So with the production of carbon in the early universe, we have introduced another bias within the system. This time, it is within the chemical realm, where carbon atoms are inclined towards making complex organic molecules, if given the opportunity. These organic molecules have already been detected in interstellar gas clouds in such quantities that their presence can be detected here on Earth 27,000 light years away. So we're not looking at a few chance events, but at a universe where natural processes produce complex organic molecules, even in the vacuum of interstellar space. The probability that these molecules assemble by mere chance is extremely low, but we're not looking at pure chance here, but a natural process. Although these molecules are not as complex as proteins, they're only a small step away from amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. Dr. Veith spent some time describing the implausibility of long complex chains of molecules forming by chance, which has an element of truth about it. But atoms do seem attracted to other atoms. Crystals are huge lattice arrays, which form because atoms bond. A lot of people would have grown crystals in school projects. Given the correct solution, the formation of crystals becomes more likely than not. But this is not what Dr. Veith refers to. He refers to long complex molecules. And here we come to the issue. The core misstep in reasoning which lay at the heart of the junkyard tornado analogy. We are not considering a single spontaneous event that produces a complex biological system, but rather a series of incremental events over considerable time. 
It's just as unlikely that you would get a house by blowing up a junkyard as it is for a complex organic molecule to arise spontaneously from the primordial soup. However life arose, by whatever method, there must have been some physical constraints at each stage that ensured that each of the many necessary steps to life had a reasonable likelihood. It is only when we consider the whole that it would appear to be highly unlikely. Dr. Vieth's appeal to improbability in relation to abiogenesis is similar to the appeal to complexity made by creationists in relation to evolution, and fails for the same reason. There is almost universal agreement among scientists that life did not come about by chance, and that if in the near future we come to a better understanding of the physical and biological conditions and processes involved, the emergence of life here on Earth might come to be seen as likely, or at least not very surprising, given the physical forces and the initial conditions prevailing in the early history of the planet. But even if we developed a plausible account of how life might have arisen on this planet, we could never be sure it happened that particular way, because there were no witnesses to the event, and life itself radically changes the environment, perhaps wiping out forever any evidence of competing organic forms. There is one thing we can be certain of, and that is the probability of life on this planet is one. Not a very impressive number, but perhaps a more significant number than 10 to the 80. adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Subscribestar page. If you're unable to support my work through Subscribestar, you can share, like or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching.